thinking I would do, excellent, Sorry, I got it, <laughs> is um, I would uh, give kind of a short presentation, an overview of kind of how I think about osteoporosis, which is really the main clinical problem. Uh, you know, most of the patients that I see have osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease. Um, and hopefully that'll be a nice kind of launching pad for uh, the, the discussion. And, you know, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time uh, to get to the questions uh, that, that you all have. And if there are additional questions that come up during the presentation, I'm happy to take those as well. So forgive me if I kind of go a little bit quick through the presentation, because I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for back and forth. Um, oh, it says that I can't share my screen. Oh, you may oh, need to do something. Right. To Hold on just that. a moment. There's always um, a... Okay, now you should be able to. Okay, and whenever I go to go into presenter mode, there's always a momentary delay. Um, I promise you that it's not my computer crashing. It's just the way it has to, Zoom has to talk to my computer. <laughs> so this is the delay. <laughs> it's always kind of like a, a moment of dread. Is it is it gonna happen or not, but it does. There we go. Um, and then I have to hit this button and then there's another delay. Um, great, so can you see my slides? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And when I go forward, you can see that picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for the invitation to be a part of this uh, discussion tonight. Um, I really don't have to tell uh, you all that osteoporosis is really a, a very important problem, public health problem in our aging population. We know that uh, bone fragility um, as individuals age is associated with significant what we call morbidity or kind of pain and constant pain and suffering. You can see here kind of progressive generations with compression fractures of the spine that can lead to problems walking and problems breathing and significant back pain. Um, and, and so kind of what is osteoporosis? I think it's important that we're all kind of on the same terms uh, by way of definitions. And so they're really kind of two uh, ways that we define osteoporosis clinically, um, either uh, having a low bone density, and we'll talk about exactly about what that means, or having weak bones. And so how do we say that bo bones are weak? Um, you know, generally we use the word fragility fracture as a fracture that occurs with minimal trauma, meaning a fall from standing height. So, you know, you can get in a car accident or fall off a building and break a bone. That doesn't really count as a fragility fracture. A fragility fracture is if you slip on ice or, um, you know, fall from a step in the kitchen and that leads to a broken bone. Uh, there are lots of these uh, fragility fractures every year and all of them lead to pain and disability. Really the fractures that we care the most about and want to prevent are hip fractures. Um, unfortunately, we know that hip fractures when they happen in individuals over 60 can are associated not just with morbidity, pain and suffering, but actually with mortality or death. There's about a 20% in risk of death in the year after a hip fracture. And that's kind of related to the, the um, you know, needing surgery, having problems uh, with, the, with the immediate surgery, but also kind of an inability to regain functional independence. Uh, as you can see by the statistics here. So this is a big problem for lots of people. It really hits home for me. Uh, this is me with my mother, sister, and uh, two daughters. And I wanted to highlight in this picture my grandmother who gave me permission to share her, um, her medical history. So she's now 93 and she's still um, independent. But you know, I think over the past 20 or 30 years, I really saw the consequences of osteoporosis um, you know, play out for her you know, with each progressive fracture Fracture, really, she lost, you know, a bit of independence, a bit of, you know, the ability to do the things that she wanted to do, um, and is, you know, lost uh, height. And it was really kind of seeing those fractures during my clinical training that made me decide to want to focus on, on this disease area. And, you know, we know that there's a big component of, uh, there's a big hereditary component to osteoporosis. So I hope that kind of the things that we can do to um, help um, our current patients with osteoporosis can also help our future patients. And so thinking about, you know, my, my, uh, my mother, sister, and, and, and daughters, um, you know, we want to be sure that we're kind of thinking about building better bones for the entire population. So, you know, what I wanted to do today is to kind of quickly cover um, a, 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 a few important 
points in osteoporosis care uh, based on the outline that we can see that you can see here. So first, you know, bone is alive. And I think understanding that bone is alive is extremely important in thinking about how we approach uh, treatment for osteoporosis. So in school, we learn that you kind of have these two processes happening at once. You have bone being built by osteoblasts and bone being destroyed by cells called osteoclasts. And so it's this balance between bone formation and bone resorption, which is bone destruction, that determines how much bone you have. And that's a process that's called skeletal remodeling. And as we start talking about treatments for osteoporosis, it's important to kind of remember which the cell you know, which process in bone the treatments act upon. Um, in addition to these osteoblasts and osteoclasts, we have these really beautiful cells called osteocytes. Um, osteocytes are, uh, you can see here, this is bone tissue. And now we're looking kind of at a very high magnification inside the bone. You have these really beautiful cells. They have this like cigar shape to them. But in addition to the cell body, they have these processes that they use to talk to each other. So osteocytes talk to each other. Um, and I think of like, you know, what are they, what are they doing? I think of osteocytes as kind of the conductors of the orchestra of bone. So you have, as I mentioned, bone being built by osteoblasts and bone being destroyed by osteoclasts. And the osteocytes are telling these cells, or they're, they're you know, telling the blasts of the class what to do. Osteocytes make proteins. Uh, like rank ligand, which we'll talk about a little bit, and sclerostin, which we'll also talk about a little bit, that basically control the activity of blasts and clasps. So the osteocytes are kind of listening to what's coming into the bone and then relaying that information to the cells on bone surfaces. So kind of what are the, the things that osteocytes need to respond to? There are different cues that come into the skeleton. And generally, I would kind of group those two different cues into, into two. There are hormones that influence bone. I'm an endocrinologist, you know, I study hormones. And one of the reasons that endocrinologists care so much about osteoporosis is because, um, uh, be, because hormones have such a profound influence on bone remodeling. Um, and then there are mechanical forces that also regulate bone remodeling. And so we'll talk a little bit about those two things, the hormones and mechanical forces and how they're kind of interpreted and then how that information is relayed from the osteocytes to the cells on the bone surfaces. Um, so first hormones, really the most important hormone that we care about for bone is something called parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone comes from the parathyroid gland, which is in, in your neck. Um, it's called parathyroid because it's right next to your thyroid. It's different than the thyroid. The job of parathyroid the parathyroid gland and the hormone it makes parathyroid hormone is to keep your blood calcium levels normal. If your blood calcium levels start to dip, you're, it, it's really bad. Your heart stops working and your brain won't work. And so we want, really want to avoid those two things from happening. And so the parathyroid gland can sense if blood calcium levels start to dip. And if that happens, the parathyroid gland secretes this parathyroid hormone. And so what parathyroid hormones wants to do, what its job is to bring those calcium levels back up to normal. Um, so it does that through several processes. But one thing it does is, you know, 99% of the calcium in our body is, is stored away in bone. And so if the blood calcium levels are starting to dip, parathyroid hormone can steal a little bit of that calcium from bone. And that's really the major way that parathyroid hormone works quickly to bring up our blood calcium. So, you know, the key here, and we'll talk about this in, in a few slides is we want to prevent our body from making too much parathyroid hormone. And the way to do that is to get enough calcium and vitamin D. And so we'll talk about kind of exactly how to do that um, in, in a few slides. Um, but then once calcium comes out of bone, you make less parathyroid hormone. And so the cycle is kind of complete. And that's uh, a very important mechanism that uh, bone uses to that, that, uh, that is happening all the time in our bodies to kind of keep our blood calcium levels normal. Um, so in addition to sensing hormones, notably parathyroid hormone, uh, these osteocytes, these cells in bone, also are sensing uh, the mechanical forces on bone. Um, and so you, you may have kind of heard this already, but if not, I'll tell you. So a major kind of limitation to long-term space flight or you know, life on Mars is the fact that with, uh, with low gravity, bone mass goes down tremendously. Um, so astronauts lose a ton of bone mass um, in the time that they're floating around in space. Um, and on the flip side, 
uh, tennis players and athletes have higher bone mass in the arms that they use. And so this is really best illustrated for tennis players who have higher bone mass in their dominant arm compared to their non-dominant arm. Here you can see this is a professional tennis player. You know, their left arm looks fine, but their right arm is even more dense. And so this shows that the, um, you know, our bones are alive and well, and they're sensing the mechanical cues that are happening to them. And it turns out that these osteocytes, these cells that I mentioned to you, are the cells that are sensing the mechanical cues and that are relaying that information about how much, you know, you're, how, how much you're exercising, how much weight your bones are bearing to the um, cells on the bone surfaces. Um, how do they do that? Um, this is kind of zooming way in on one of those osteocytes. And remember, they have these processes coming out of the cell. <laughs> It turns out that these processes are surrounded by a little bit of fluid. This white space here is the space between the, the process of the cell and the bone, which I'm pointing to here. So every time you take a step, every time you jump up and down, this fluid around your osteocytes kind of sloshes back and forth a little bit, it moves. And it's really that fluid flow that the osteocytes are sensing that is telling them that there's some mechanical loading happening. And then when the, when the cells sense that fluid flow, they then talk to the osteoblasts and tell osteoblasts to make more bone. And so this is how osteocytes are sensing these mechanical forces and why it's so important to exercise to maintain kind of strong, healthy bone. Um, so this is kind of, that was kind of a quick overview of how we think of bone as a tissue that's kind of always alive and remodeling where we have bone forming osteoblasts, bone destroying osteoclasts, and osteocytes, which are taking this information from hormones and mechanical cues to kind of orchestrate uh, bone remodeling. So now kind of moving from science into practice, we'll kind of talk about kind of how bone mass is regulated over your lifetime and kind of what we can do to keep our bones strong. Um, so, as you may know, um, you know, when we're first born as babies, our skeletons, they really, they need to be pretty soft so we can get out of the birth canal. And, you know, you've probably seen little babies who have very soft skulls. And so, you know, our skeletons are only partly mineralized at birth. But, you know, as with time, you know, especially during puberty, we accrue lots of bone mass. And that's why it's so important to, you know, eat milk and uh, uh, ch cheese as a child, because we need lots and lots of calcium to accrue this normal amount of bone during the years of puberty. Um, the maximal rate of bone accru accrual or gains in bone mass happen around age 12 and 14 in boys and girls. And by the time you're about 18, you really have reached about your peak. And then you have this period of your life between age 18 and 40 or 50, where that peak bone mass is maintained. Um, and then, you know, over time with aging, there's kind of uh, bone loss. Um, with, in women, that age-related bone loss, unfortunately, is accelerated a little bit by the menopausal transition. We know that uh, uh, sex hormones maintain bone mass, so the loss of estrogen during menopause contributes to aging-related bone loss, but it's more than just uh, menopause. We know that men also lose bone mass as they age, and there are factors that are independent of estrogen that can um, contribute to bone loss. So it's really this kind of sl slow decline in bone mass that happens with aging, such that eventually, you know, we cross this threshold where we start to worry about fracture risk. So a lot of things, unfortunately, can kind of go wrong here. We can have, you know, if you have malnutrition as a child or, you know, kids who have cancer and receive chemotherapy, you know, never really achieve the peak bone mass. Um, later on in life, there are a number of additional problems listed here. I'm not going to go through these one by one, but when I see patients with osteoporosis, I'm kind of thinking through, you know, all of these issues to make sure there isn't kind of a reversible or modifiable risk factor that's contributing to bone loss um, and pushing people into that area where the risk of bro breaking bones is, um, is increased. Um, so, you know, as we, we just reviewed, you know, the amount of bone that you have now is really kind of an integration of many different inputs that have happened in your life since birth. Um, you know, we talked about all these environmental factors. There are also fixed factors, meaning genetic genetics make a big difference um, in terms of uh, in terms of bone mass. Um, so now, uh, you know, I, I think these are the questions that are probably most important to this group. Um, what what can I do? You know, how can we evaluate bone mass? And then what do we do with that? 
that information? What are some of the interventions, both lifestyles and medications that we can think about? So at a very simple level, you know, this is probably a picture that you've seen already. Healthy bone is thick and strong and in osteoporosis, we lose bone mass. And quite simply, less bone means there's a greater chance of fractures. In addition to having less bone in osteoporosis, there may be problems with the quality of the bone that, even, that does exist. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember. And so our current diagnostic tools really don't fully capture that issue of you know, bone quality, but that's kind of a major research focus for the future. Uh, you probably, uh, you, you mostly are familiar with a, a bone density test or a DEXA, which is a very low energy x-ray. It's you get the same amount of radiation as when you fly across the country on an airplane um, that measures kind of how thick the bones are in the spine and the hip. And, you know, this measurement of bone density is then compared to everybody else. And you get a T-score, you know, that T-score reflects how many standard deviations your bone density is from the general population. Um, and so no, uh, generally we want that T-score to be a higher, absolute, a, a higher number. Um, and normal bone density is basically T-scores that are above a number of minus one. Uh, when the bone density is between a T-score of minus one and minus 2.5, that falls into to the osteopenia range, and then T-scores of less than minus 2.5 um, indicate osteoporosis. First, we're going to talk about, you know, what, what, do we, what do we do if the bone density is in the osteopenia range at all sites, at the spine and the hip? Um, and that's kind of a common thing that comes up. You know, we do lots of screening, screening bone density tests and often, more, more often than not, those show osteopenic bone density. Um, for individuals with osteopenic bone density, we, uh, uh, we use a tool called FRAX, uh, which is a fracture risk calculator that's designed to be used for individuals who have osteopenia at all sites, of, at all their measured sites. And so as you can see here, the FRAX calculator takes a lot of different information and you can Google FRAX, F-R-A-X, and see the calculator yourself. And you basically put, you know, all this different information into the uh, FRAX calculator, and you come up with a kind of 10-year risks of fracture, both of a hip fracture and of a major osteoporotic fracture. And we really, we use these numbers quite a bit to help determine, you know, whether or not somebody is what we call low risk or high risk. So by that, we, and here we use cutoff, very specific cutoff. A cutoff of a three is used 3% for hip fracture and 20% for major osteoporotic fracture. So if these number, if this bottom number is below three and this top number is below 20, as is the case here where we have 1.8 and 10, then we would say that an individual has osteopenia and has a low risk of fracture. And this would be somebody who, for whom lifestyle interventions alone would be recommended. Um, because the benefit of, of using an osteoporosis medication probably isn't that great in somebody with osteopenic bone density and low FRAX scores. Um, and so by lifestyle, what do we mean? Um, calcium is very important. And as we discussed already, the reason that calcium is important is because it prevents you from making too much parathyroid hormone. By getting enough calcium from your diet, your parathyroid gland doesn't need to steal it from bone. And so generally about a thousand milligrams of calcium a day Day are about enough. I mean, that uh, ends up being about 300, uh, uh, three servings, because, you know, a cup of milk is about 300 milligrams. You can see the amounts that are listed here. Um, generally speaking, I think it's better to get calcium through dietary sources than through supplements. But some people, you know, if you have lactose intolerance or have other reasons that you can't get the calcium through dietary sources, uh, supplements are certainly fine as well. Um, most people do perfectly fine with calcium carbonate, uh, based supplements, so it would be like Caltrate or even Tums. Um, however, people who are on proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers for acid reflux won't absorb the calcium carbonate very well. And so for that reason, citrate-based um, options are preferred. Um, vitamin D is important to help our gut absorb calcium. And then um, uh, weight-bearing exercise is also important. You really, we don't want to become an astronaut here. You know, any weight that you can, weight-bearing exercise that you can get is going to keep those, the mo fluid moving over those osteocytes so that our um, uh, bone remodeling can stay high, can stay healthy. And, you know, sometimes uh, physical therapists can help if there are problems with frequent falls or gait problems, or even to re recommend uh, strengthening exercises for the muscles and the, it, it, 
in the spine. And obviously thinking about fall precautions is a very important thing. You know, often yeah. people have kind of a slippery step to get into their bathtub or kind of a step going down into the basement that creeps, you know, and I think it's important to kind of think about where you live and where you might fall and what can be done to try to try to help there. Um, yeah. The, um, uh, in, in, with respect to exercise, you know, any exercise is good, really. Um, weight bearing exercises are better. Um, yoga is quite safe. Um, there are some Pilates programs that have kind of too much uh, spine flexion. And so those may be things that you would want to avoid. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, kind of speaking with your physician or physical therapist about specific exercises, if, if, if questions come up is important. Um, you can go to this uh, Buff Bones website if you're interested. It's kind of a good uh, uh, weight bearing exercise program that's especially tailored for individuals with osteoporosis. Um, I'm going to skip these slides in the interest of time, uh, just to kind of mention that um, the kind of how spine fractures occur is a big open question. And there's a lot of research going on in the um, area of understanding kind of how weight supplied to the spine interacts with muscles that ultimately contribute to the risk of spine fractures. A lot of that research is being conducted by one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Mary Buxine, who's based at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, but, uh, re but really what I want to focus on in the remaining few minutes of my talk and then moving into the questions is kind of what about medications? Um, so for individuals who have osteoporosis that's in the bone density range or who have osteopenia but high FRAX scores, we know that all of these lifestyle interventions that I men met mentioned, you know, these are great things and you definitely want to be doing them, but they're not going to do the trick. You know, your risk of fracture, unfortunately, is, is, is significantly elevated to the point that the lifestyle interventions are going to help kind of maintain your bone mass, but they're not going to really um, uh, cure your osteoporosis. They're not going to be able to bring your uh, bone density out of the um, osteoporosis range or reduce your fracture risk to an acceptable level. So that's really where the medications come in. Um, and so going back to our diagram about bone formation and bone resorption, we have two general classes of osteoporosis medications. The first class falls into medications that block bone destruction. Uh, those are called, we call anti-resorptive medications. And the second class of medications falls into a group of medications that stimulate bone formation. And that we, those we call bone anabolic uh, medications. So what we're gonna do next is kind of talk about uh, generally the medications that we uh, use for osteoporosis, talk about importantly their benefits uh, and also their risks. So on the left are the anti-resorptive medications. And these are really the most commonly used medications for individuals with, with osteoporosis. Um, uh, bisphosphonates are kind of the major class of anti-resorptive medications, and these fit in, fall into orally available medications like alendronate or Fosamax and resedronate or actinel or evandronate, Beneva, um, or IV bisphosphonates, which um, uh, are uh, very effective medications to increase bone density and lower fracture risk. And these are often given to people who have acid reflux or other reasons that they cannot tolerate oral Phosphonates. There are other anti-resorptive medications which are listed here. We know that estrogen is a very potent um, anti-resorptive medication, uh, but generally it's long-term use isn't recommended due to risks of breast cancer um, and cardiovascular disease. And then more recently, denosumab, uh, which is an antibody that targets um, a, a factor that's needed for osteoclasts to grow, has been developed as an additional anti-resorptive medication. So we have several anti-resorptive medications um, um, that are generally the first line therapy that we think about for patients who have osteoporosis by bone density or by fragility fractures or osteopenia with um, a uh, uh, high fracture risk based on the frax uh, algorithms. In addition to anti-resorptives, you know, we're now lucky to have three uh, different bone anabolic medications, which are listed here. Uh, you know, these medications are all, all require injections. Um, the, the first two, uh, teriparatide and abaloparatide, require a small self-injection each day with a tiny little needle. Um, and uh, the final medication, romosozumab, is a monthly injection. So um, uh, the, these bone anabolic medications are newer agents. Uh, you know, we have 
have lots of experience with all three of them, but because they're newer agents and have, um, uh, you know, re require injections, generally the anti-resorptives are thought of as first line therapies, but certainly we'll come back to this question about, you know, which medication to choose and when in the, uh, in, in the question and answer uh, section. So. Um, with, we talk a lot about the risks of osteoporosis medications. Before talking about the risks, I want to mention the benefits. So all of the medications that are listed here have been shown in very well-designed studies to increase bone density and lower fractures. And so those benefits, I think, are very important to keep in mind and thinking about kind of the risk-benefit ratio because, um, you know, for individuals who have um, who, who are at high risk for fragility fractures, taking a medication that's known to prevent fractures is a, you know, quite a considerable benefit. And that really needs to be weighed against um, the, 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 some of the risks of these medications. Um, so bisphosphonates are kind of the most commonly used medications. So we'll kind of get a little bit into more detail about some of the, the risks associated with bisphosphonate therapy. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the oral bisphosphonates can be associated with uh, uh, irritation of the esophagus and kind of GI symptoms. This happens in about 10% of the people who take these medications. And I kind of think of this as a common but not necessarily serious side effect. Um, the, the, those symptoms typically go away once the medication is stopped. Um, and, you know, in my years of prescribing these medications to hundreds and hundreds of women, you know, the, um, the GI side effects of oral bisphosphonates have never kind of caused anybody to end up in the hospital or require kind of serious because they uh, are so quickly reversible. Um, in contrast, there are two other side effects of bisphosphonates that are much more serious. Um, and those are osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical fractures of the femur. So I'm going to talk about both of those uh, for a few minutes on this slide. So osteonecrosis of the jaw, what is it? It's basically a dental infection that cannot heal. Um, and the reason that this happens for people who have been on bisphosphonate medications for long periods of time is that bone resorption is needed to heal dental infections. Um, and so we see osteonecrosis of the jaw uh, at an incidence of about one in 10,000. And people who have been on bisphosphonates for more than five years um, and have bad teeth. You know, this doesn't happen to spontaneously to people who are seeing the dentist regularly and have, you know, routine cleanings and have their kind of preventative dental work done. Um, so this is kind of something that we certainly worry about. And the incidence of osteoporosis of the jaw goes up with even longer term therapy. So, you know, basically we don't see jaw necrosis for people who have been on bisphosphonates for less than five years, but in more than five years, and especially more than 10 years of therapy, you know, really the perspective changes. The second, um, a uh, side effect associated with long-term bisphosphonate therapy are these atypical femur fractures. So these are stress fractures that occur of the middle of the thigh, to the middle of the thigh bone, a region that normally is quite strong. Um, and so what I think of here, if you think of the middle of the thigh, it's a bone that's very strong to begin with. So if you take a bone that's already very strong and you make it even stronger, which is what you're doing with a bisphosphonate, you think about like chalk is like so strong that it can break and crack. And so that's really what these atypical fractures are. They're kind of overdoing it with the bisphosphonate to the point that the middle of the thigh bone becomes too strong. Um, and again, you know, this is really, really highly related to the duration of therapy. You know, we don't see atypical fractures for the most part in people who are treated for less than five years. And for more than five years, the incidence is about one in 5,000. It goes up to about one in 2,000 after more than 10 years of therapy. Um, you know, these rare side effects are important enough that I think a lot of people kind of think twice about using bisphosphonate phosphonate therapies. And obviously they've garnered a lot of attention with, with articles in the New York Times. Um, I think it's important to kind of remember the risk of these rare side effects related to the risk of experiencing a hip fracture, which is a dreaded complication of the disease itself. And for individuals who are at high risk for fragility fractures, you know, the risk of a hip fracture can be about one in 25. And we know that these medications lower that risk by almost 80%. So we're talking about kind of a situation where at least at the beginning of starting therapy, you know, the benefits uh, greatly outweigh the risks. But this risk benefit ratio really can change 
change over time, such that with long-term therapy, you know, it may be that we're exposing patients to more harm than good with long-term bisphosphonate therapy. And that's really where this kind of concept of like an osteoporosis life plan comes in. You know, when I see a patient for the first time who's in her 60s and 70s, even 80s, you know, I, I, I'm not starting one therapy and continuing it forever. You know, I think it's thinking about all these different medications that we have available and how we're going to kind of add, use those either sequentially or, or in combinations to best kind of reduce fracture risk while also worrying about these complications that are associated with the duration of therapy in the back of my mind. Um, so hopefully I've kind of given you an initial kind of way at least that I approach thinking about lifestyle changes, uh, lifestyle interventions and medications, uh, really briefly, kind of where is the field going as a kind of uh, academic uh, scientist, physician scientist in this area, these are, uh, topics are very important to me and, you know, hopefully um, we can continue to kind of make an impact on how the field moves forward in the years to come. There are a lot of unmet needs for patients like you with osteoporosis. You know, we need better ways to predict who's at risk for low bone density, poor Poor bone quality, which I already mentioned, and who's at risk for fractures. There are some people who have fragility fractures whose bone density is quite normal. You know, what can we, what more can we be doing to identify those people? We need better ways to prevent the development of osteoporosis in the first place. You know, can we think about, you know, identifying people in their 30s and 40s and recommending lifestyle interventions then such that they don't develop osteoporosis in the future? We have all these existing therapies. You know, I'd say we've learned a lot about how to use them, but we need to learn more. You know, what are the best orders to be using our therapies in? Should we be using them in combinations rather than one at a time? You know, what about stopping therapy? What, what, how do we fit drug holidays into the life plans for patients with osteoporosis? Uh, we need to know more about how bone remodels so that we can come up with new ways to treat this disease. Um, and I think that, you know, as I mentioned with these oral, with these bone anabolic medications, all of them require injections. And I think we need to be working on ways to develop new orally available bone anabolic medications. Um, so my lab, which is based at the Mass General Hospital Endocrine Unit, is really focused on osteocytes, but motivated by, by patients like you who have osteoporosis. We're trying to understand you know, how osteocytes are responding to parathyroid hormone mechanical cues and how the cells get these beautiful dendrites. And the goal of all of this research is really to come up with new ways to treat osteoporosis. Here we are as a lab kind of meeting uh, during the pandemic that more recently uh, it's wonderful that we've been able to get together. I put my email address on the bottom of the slides here. I'm always uh, happy to uh, discuss any of the topics that we talked about uh, today um, and our lab's uh, website is uh, listed on the bottom right. You can feel free to take a screenshot of the slide if, uh, th if that would be helpful. Um, so that's really it that I wanted to say. Hopefully I've convinced you all that bone um, is kind of alive and well, that our bone mass changes during the lifetime. And we've talked about some of the interventions. I apologize if I went over a little bit, but hopefully there's still plenty of time for plenty of time for questions. I'll, I should stop my share now, right, Shelly? Yes, that'd be great. This was wonderful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, this was wonderful. Uh, so, so wonderful that I want to say I want to deviate from our schedule so that we are polite to you and also we have the, these questions answered. Um, was it okay with you if we keep going on the questions for a bit? Oh, sure. No, I'm happy to stick around. I told my daughter that I would put her to bed at 8.15. So okay, um, all right. uh, my, my heart stopped. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, I'm going to turn the program over to you, doctor, and also to our two um, questioners, uh, uh, Rika and Lynn. No. no, not me. I'm sorry, not Lynn. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lola. Lola. Rika and Lola. I don't know why. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'll start first, and, and I think you might already know this, Dr. Wein, um, that there was um, a list that Shelley had um, received from, from folks. And in a way now, you know, some of them might sort of overlap on your presentation, but I'm just gonna read and, and you know, we'll see how we go, right? And Rika's gonna do the same with, with um, when, she, when she speaks. Um, so is recommending medication your first line of treatment slash defense? If it is, why? Why is Fosamax often given first when an anabolic treatment has a higher efficacy? 
Yeah, I mean, so those are all kind of excellent questions. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that the, the key to, you know, what to recommend first is really personalized about who you are and kind of what, what's happened to you. So, um, you know, generally kind of for individuals who have a, a diagnosis of osteoporosis based on having a, a bone density in the osteoporosis range at, at any site or um, have had a fragility fracture with an osteopenic bone density or have an osteopenic bone density and high fracture risk, based on this FRAX algorithm, you know, medication is advised, um, you know, and obviously this is a discussion, you know, some people kind of are right at the threshold and like, oh, can we wait a little while? You know, that's, um, you know, I, I think if the personal preference is strong, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I never, you know, mandate anything to a patient. It's always kind of a discussion about risks and benefits. Um, and, and so, um, but in general, you know, unfortunately the lifestyle interventions that I discussed, you know, they've never really been shown to kind of cure osteoporosis. They, they stabilize osteopenia so and they're very important to do you know so you know sometimes i'll talk to a patient and they you know literally are an astronaut they're sitting on the couch all day and like not getting any weight bearing activity or their vitamin d level is you know you know so low that we can't even measure it um and so for those people you know we'll give a trial of a lifestyle intervention first because there can be a benefit but for most people you know there isn't a huge amount of room to make a positive impact from these lifestyle changes and that's why um, you know, going to the medications along with continuing the lifestyle medications works well. And so then, you know, what do we use first? What do we use first? Um, I think that um, the reason that Fosamax or Alendronate is often recommended as first line therapy or several, first of all, it's been around for 25 years. So, you know, we know this medication very, very well. You know, we know the, the risks as we talked about and those risks we know about because we've been studying it for so long, so carefully in millions and millions of people, men and women. Um, but, and, but we also know the benefits and, you know, we know that in study after study, it shows increased bone density, fewer fractures and, um, uh, and, you know, those are definitely great benefits. And the other reason that it's often recommended up front is that, you know, when you look at the cost benefit ratio, this is a generic medication. So the cost is very low. The cost to you, your insurer and to society as a whole is very low. So we've got a great effective medication that kind of does a lot of the things that we want to do. And that's generally why it's recommended first. Um, you know, what I just said is kind of the, you know, the, the mainstream way of thinking about osteoporosis, uh, approaching uh, kind of first line therapy with osteoporosis. And I think the other thing to say is that, you know, many primary care doctors are the ones who are ma managing this disease. And, you know, they're also managing your high blood pressure and cholesterol and cancer screening and, you know, getting your vac vac vaccinated. So lots of other things. And so, you know, for a primary care doctor recommending, you know, Fosamax up front, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I do it sometimes as well as a special you know, so then, you know, why would it, what about some of these other options? Why wouldn't you go for a bone anabolic agent first? Um, you know, there isn't really great prospective data from clinical trials to support, you know, what order to use our medications in. There is some indication that, you know, previous treatment with a bisphosphonate can actually blunt the efficacy of the bone anabolic agent. And so that's kind of a concern that I have, you know, both from, you know, human studies and certainly from animal studies, you know, it seems like, you know, maybe there's a bit of a blunting of the, of the, of the eff efficacy of the anabolic agent from previous bisphosphonate therapy. Um, th the other thing to say is that we know that after treating with an anabolic agent, we need to consolidate the gain of bone density that you get from that. And so there's going to be a bisphosphonate after the anabolic agent as well. And so, you know, I, I think I and a number of other endocrinologists in the field are kind of thinking hard about this question about whether to use ana upfront therapy with anabolic agents. And certainly, you know, it depends on the patient. If your bone density is minus 2.6 and you're a healthy 61 year old, um, you know, you're not going to break, you, uh, break, break your head in the next five years or it's extremely unlikely. And so for people with mild osteoporosis, you know, I would have a higher threshold to think about kind of first line therapy with the bisphosphonate, but uh, with an anabolic agent. But if your T-scores are minus four and you've already broken your hip, you know, that's a different story. And the urgency and need to kind of bring up the bone density quickly is much greater. And so that's another instance where we would think about using upfront therapy with a bone anabolic agent. But, you know, I would say this is a moving target for sure. 
Um, and, um, you know, I think if you were to ask 10 endocrinologists that question, you get 10 slightly different um, answers. But, but I, I think that what I summarized is kind of a, how most people in the field are thinking about it right now. That's great. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Um, of the medications that you recommend and any combinations of them, um, where have you seen the largest gains in scores? Uh, that's a great question. So the, there's limited data on combinations. Um, so if you just look at monotherapy, you know, the medication that in, there are two medications that are really the best at increasing bone density, if that's what you want to talk about. Um, and those are the two biologics that we have. Petrolia or denosumab is very effective at increasing hip bone density. Um, you know, uh, probably because of the way it works. It goes to bone and it totally makes your osteoclast disappear. And so prolia is very effective at increasing bo uh, bone density, oh, bone density yeah. measurements. Um, and Avinity, which is the new kid on the black block, or Romosozumab, um, it's an anabolic medication that needs to be given by an injection once a month. Um, it can only be used for a year as an anabolic therapy, but it also gives a pretty impressive increase in hip bone density. You can, with both of, with with romosozumab, you can see an increase in hip bone density of about 5% in a year, which is, you know, what we get for after five years of uh, Fosamax. So if, you know, your bone density is very low and you want to bring it up quickly, you know, those are probably the two best monotherapies that you can think about. Combination therapy is less well studied. You know, what I would say is that there's some very impressive data from my colleagues at Mass General who showed that the combination of uh, Forteo and Prolia or which is teriparatide and denosumab, you know, that specific combination seems even better than the Roma, than Avinity, even better than romosozumab at increasing bone density. So, you know, if I have a patient that I'm extremely worried about, you know, I'll probably go for the com that combination of Forteo and, and denosumab. Uh, it's not often covered by insurance. There's a whole nother topic that I didn't really get into with the first question of, you know, ensuring what, what payers will cover. And, um, you know, that's kind of not as interesting as the science that we're talking about now. Um, but in general, um, you know, getting providers to cover combination therapy can be challenging. And the same is true for upfront anabolic therapy, unfortunately. But that's, I think it's going to be a moving target over the next few years. Okay. Um, how does a patient know his or her level of osteoconcern? Well, the next question you've talked about, would you explain the FRAX? Um, but more importantly, how do we determine the level of concern? For example, if a patient has a good hip score and a worse lumbar score, but has had minimum previous fractures, what are the real issues in future fracturing? Is it only an inconvenience or are there other concerns? Yeah, so we know that having a low score anywhere suggest indicates a high risk of fracture everywhere, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, exactly why that is, we don't totally understand. But having, for, like the scenario that you mentioned, having a, a, a uh, having a low score in the spine with a normal score in the hip, your your risk of hip fracture, unfortunately, is still increased. Um, in that situation, the same thing is true the other way around. If your score is low in the hip but okay in the spine, your risk of spine fracture um, is still increased in that situation. So, um, you know, in general, we kind of use the lowest score and go by that. And that's, that we don't just do that because we want to be mean and treat everybody. We 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 use that information from based on clinical studies that demonstrate that having a low score. And at any site is associated epidemiologically with an increased risk of fracture. Um, so then, you know, what is the risk? And that's really where the FRAX numbers come in. You know, these numbers, three and 20%, it can be hard for like us to know what to be, make of those. Um, but, you know, I, I think that thinking about a 3% risk of a hip fracture over the next 10 years, um, you know, that means that it's not 1%. Um, uh, it's not 10% either. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that um, risk is, and, and certainly if you kind of crunch numbers and start thinking about how much a hip fracture may take away from your life expectancy and quality of life and ability to contribute to society, you know, that 3% threshold kind of makes sense. And that's kind of where, where it came from. But I think it's really the FRAX calculator that kind of can be most helpful for people in thinking about what their fractures may be. And just remembering that the FRAX numbers kind of underestimate your fracture risk if you have a, a bone density in the osteoporosis range. 
Um, but you know, I, I think this is a great question to be talking about with your physician who knows your your entire history well, because mm -hmm. um, that person I think is going to be best to kind of understanding what you know what your risk is and kind of but and I think understanding what your fracture risk is is really important and thinking about what the benefits are that you're going to be getting from medications. Okay, um, we've heard the uh, Forteo and that class of drugs, the anabolics, uh, may be approved for more than 18 months, I think, uh, period. Can you tell us where that stands, if that's going to be extended at all? or? Yeah, so currently the PTH therapy is so Forteo and Timlos, which is, Timlos is basically like a Me Too version of Forteo. It's very similar. Those two medications are both approved for two years of use, so 24 months. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, I, I and many providers of the field have certainly used them for more than 24 months. That's what the, the FDA suggests that they be used for 24 months. It doesn't really make sense. So we make parathyroid hormone, you know, in our, from a parathyroid gland in our neck. Forteo is parathyroid hormone. So basically we're giving ourselves, you know, a little bit more of a hormone that we normally would make. Why should we limit it for two years? Um, you know, the reason is that there were studies in this one strain of rats that where they were treated, when they were treated with massive doses of Forteo, they developed bone cancers, which didn't occur in other strains of rats, mice, and, you know, these bone cancers haven't happened to humans. So I think that this, like, uh, two-year uh, limit on the duration of uh, anabolic therapy use, you know, is, I don't know if the FDA is going to change their mind and, you know, change the labels, but uh, certainly, um, um, if, if needed, you know, I think there are many providers who would, you know, retreat with another course of anabolic therapy. Let me give you an example. You know, so let's say you're 65 and you've broken your hip um, and, you know, we decide that anabolic therapy makes a lot of sense. So then we would treat for two years with Forte or Timlos. And so now you're 67. Okay. Uh, we, we want to keep treating your osteoporosis because the risk of hip fracture is reduced, but it hasn't totally gone away. Mm -hmm. So then we would think about using reclass, recla soldronic acid infusions, um, to, uh, and maybe do that for three or four years. Um, and, and now, you know, your bone density has come up, but it, what if it's still even low? And now we start worrying about these risks of long-term bisphosphonate therapy, you know, jaw necrosis atypical fractures. Um, and so weighing that versus the risks of doing another round of Forteo, um, this comes up a lot. Um, and often we'll go for another round of anabolic therapy. You know, I wouldn't use it for more than two years in a row, but I think two years kind of separated by periods on bisphosphonates. You know, what I'm saying is not like FDA approved, uh, or, um, but uh, certainly there are a lot of providers who would use that medication, medications at their discretion in the matter like I just uh, described. Lola? Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> um, what, uh, what is the current understanding of the relationship between long-term use of SSRI antidepressants and bone loss and or mm. fracture risk? What is thought to be the mechanism? What is the relative impact of SSRI use compared to other factors known to affect bone loss aside from genetics and oral steroids? How do you advise your patients using those medications? Yeah, uh, these are excellent questions. Um, so first of all, like, um, what is the relative impact, I think, is the most important of the series of questions. There have been a number of studies that have looked at the effects of SSRIs on bone mass, both in prospective, retrospective ways, animal studies, and there is kind of, I would describe it as an itty-bitty effect. Um, and, and I think that's the key, that there can be, you know, with prolonged use of high doses of SSRIs, there can be a teeny effect on bone density, whether that is associated with a change in the risk of fractures, which is what we care about more, is totally unclear. You know, the, be the best performed studies that have looked at the risk relationship between fracture risk and SSR SSRI use have come up with a, a, the answer that there is not an association, meaning that these changes in bone density that you see with SSRIs are, you know, so small that they don't even make a difference with respect to more broken bones. Um, let me talk about the mechanism first, and then I'll kind of come back to the question about what, what I say. Um, so, um, you know, there the 
the neurotransmitters that are affected by SSRIs are um, found in parts of the brain that are known to control bone mass. Actually, our hypothalamus controls how much bone we make and we form and destroy uh, through very interesting kind of neural circuits where nerves come into bone. And, you know, the SSRIs work in those parts of bone and they kind of uh, influence bone remodeling in very subtle ways. So the science is very interesting, but clinically, you know, is this important? You know, I don't think it's that important. Depression is really bad. Anxiety is really bad, you know, and people need SSRIs for those indications. And so for people who have mental health um, uh, diseases that require SSRI therapy, you know, you should never stop your SSRI because of this teeny potential effect on bone mass. Um, for people who have been on SSRIs for 15 years and feel perfectly fine, you know, I mean, you could think about tapering your SSRI with your doctor and seeing if coming off of it, what, what happens to your, your anxiety or depression. But um, for people who have active anxiety and depression, I, the benefits of SSRIs without a doubt outweigh the risks that, that, are, that are quite modest. Okay. Um, the National Osteoporosis Foundation uh, website states that a reclass for bisphosphonate holiday is recommended as long as a person is showing progress. Mm -hmm. Does that mean in some cases people would continue taking the medication without a drug holiday? Yeah, so this kind of comes back to the that scenario that I was mentioning earlier. So what if you've been on a bisphosphonate for five years or more um, and your bone density is still low? You know, for somebody like that, or, or your fracture risk is still high. You're still on steroids or, you know, having frequent falls or something like that. You know, we need to keep treating. And so the question is, what do we do? Um, for some people, it's clear that bisphosphonate is working. They're seeing the dentist regularly. Um, you know, we, we're, the, the risk of the typical fractures is extremely low. Then we kind of talk about the risks of ongoing bisphosphonate therapy, but also talk about the fact that it's probably still helping. And, you know, there's no absolute reason to stop it after five years. We just kind of keep thinking about these things. Um, you know, alternatively, after five years, that's a good time. Maybe we could switch over to an anabolic therapy to, um, you know, to kind of reset the, the skeleton and wake up bone again from it being kind of bone remodeling, being suppressed for so long on the bisphosphonate. So, you know, those are the discussions that I have every day with my patients. Um, you know, what are we doing after, you know, prolonged bisphosphonate therapy? Um, and, but, you know, there, there are no kind of hard, fast rules. And without a doubt, I have patients who have bisphosphonates for more than five years in a row. Um, if we start on reclast in our 50s or 60s, as many do, we could be on the drug for a very long time. What is the recommended protocol for thinking about, um, oh, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. What is the recommended protocol um, for this or thinking about this um, in, in terms of its long-term use? And what research or anecdotal evidence exists to show outcomes of taking this drug for decades even with drug holidays. Yeah, so this comes back to the kind of the question of like, you know, what's your life plan for osteoporosis treatment? Um, and um, you're, you're right that a lot of women do end up starting bisphosphonate therapies in their 50s. Um, for and for ver for very good reasons, and it's exactly this women that we kind of have challenges predicting exactly what we're going to do over time. We know that uh, drug holidays, uh, which is basically stopping the medication, you know, when they're appropriate, do lower the risks of jaw necrosis and of uh, atypical fractures. And those are really the two side effects of long-term bisphosphonate therapy that we want to prevent. And so, you know, one scenario, let's say you're 58 and you have osteoporotic bone density um, and have, you know, had a wrist fracture. So clearly you should be treated and um, uh, starting reclass would be a great option for somebody like that, especially if they have problems with oral bisphosphonates. So if we treat for three or four years and the bone density comes up and there are no fractures, that would be a great time for a drug holiday. And, you know, drug holidays lower the chances of atypical fractures and they lower the chances of jaw necrosis. So they certainly are, um, you know, time off the medication. It washes out your system. It's really that total exposure that your body's had that kind of dictates the risk of these rare complications. Um, and so then, you know, during drug holidays, we follow bone density, we follow clinically everything that's going on, and often we'll follow the bone turnover markers, the CTX level in the blood, which shows how much bone destruction is happening. And if that, it, you know, if the bone density starts to go down or the CTX level in the blood starts to go up, you know, that's the sign 
sign that it's phosphorus is wearing off. And so that's a sign that, um, you know, it's likely needed to retreat, but also safe to retreat because we know that it's washed out of your system enough to see that those changes are happening. Um, but, you know, the, then, you know, it's at some point in the life of that 58 year old woman that we start on reclass, um, you know, thinking about anabolic therapy, different courses of anabolic therapies, and, you know, prolia um, certainly may, may come into play. But it's very hard for me to you know, kind of predict the future with that first discussion uh, to say this is what we're going to do for the next 30 years. And I think we're learning more about how to use these medications. And there are probably going to be new medications that come out as well that are going to have a major impact in how we how we treat this disease. Uh, Rika, would you like oh, to ask? Unmute. <laughs> Rika. I'm sorry, I totally lost my connection. I had to re. I'm sorry. So um, when we look up drug side effects, um, only the results from the drug trials are, are presented. So is there any rigorous research or publications published elsewhere about long, longer term side effects and outcomes and how do we find it, um, where to look for it and any keywords we might use in looking for that information? Yeah, so what I know about is for the uh, for Forteo and for Timlos, the FDA is basically mandating that both companies do what they call post marketing surveillance for cases of osteosarcoma, which is this rare bone cancer that developed in rats. And so you know that post marketing surveillance is you know published every so often. Um, and I'm happy to, I can email Shelley, um, you know, a publication and to send out to the group. Um, unfortunately, you know, the FDA doesn't mandate much else in terms of post-marketing surveillance. I wish they did a little bit more. Um, you know, the you know, the ASBMR, which is the American Society of Bone Mineral Research, is really kind of a preeminent group um, in the world that kind of studies uh, clinical and research for, uh, for, for, for osteoporosis. And, you know, I was just at the virtual meeting uh, yesterday and the day before, and, um, you know, there's always new findings that are being reported about, you know, these issues of jaw necrosis and atypical fractures, as well as potential cardiovascular issues with the so I would say like the ASBMR, they have task forces that release recommendations. You know, I, I'd say that's a great source. Um, you know, the problem is you kind of Google a, a drug on the internet and, um, you know, a lot of people have re report symptoms, but whether those symptoms or whether those side effects are kind of actually associated with the drug or whether those are things that just kind of happen to that person, um, it can often be challenging to kind of untangle. So, um, you know, that, that's why I, I think that, you know, looking at the post-marketing surveillance has been mandated and kind of, you know, task force recommendations and findings coming out of the ASBMR are probably the best options. Thank you. Um, do you use NTX, CTX or PINP tests and um, why or why not? Yeah, so I mentioned the use the CTX, which is a bone destruction marker, which could be a useful um, test to to follow patients during their drug holidays. Uh, basically, you know, when when you're on reclast every year, that level goes very low because reclast is basically shutting off your osteoclasts. Um, and then as the reclast washes out of your system, we can see the CTX level kind of start to creep back up. Um, and in my mind, that is the um, main kind of use of monitoring bone turnover markers in clinical practice. Um, it would make a lot of sense. You know, why don't, we, when you walk into my office the first time, why don't we check your CTX and your P1NP levels? P1NP is um, a marker of bone formation. And if P1NP is low, we should use bone anabolic therapy. And if CTX is high, we should use a bone re anti an anti-resorptive therapy. That makes so much sense. But there hasn't been data to support that practice. There's actually been studies that have been done to try to use bone turnover markers to make choices about osteoporosis treatments. And, you know, they haven't really shown that that actually helps make the right decisions for treatment. And maybe there are problems with the way the studies have been done. Um, and, you know, I still kind of believe in my heart that it is, should be an effective strategy to use, but often, you know, insurance companies won't cover the testing for bone turnover markers because there hasn't been prospective data to show that they're 
useful in many clinical situations. Um, you know, I'm an endocrinologist. I think about things based on the hormones and how they work and, you know, measuring blood tests to make decisions about therapy. And so, you know, I would love to, and, and you know, maybe in five to 10 years, it'll, it will, we'll be at that point. Point. But right now, you know, really the, the use for measured bone turnover markers of routine clinical practice is kind of monitored during, during, during drug holidays. And uh, what supplements do you recommend to your patients, if any? Um, so a well-balanced diet, you know, will get you enough protein. Bone is made of protein, calcium, protein, <laughs> calcium. And so, um, you know, certainly having have sufficient dietary protein is important. Um, and, you know, a, a multivitamin uh, also can be quite helpful than calcium and vitamin D. Uh, you know, there's been lots of studies showing kind of marginal effects of other supplements. And then, you know, you do another study and it doesn't pan out. Um, and, and so really the, you know, the, the calcium, a well-balanced diet, calcium and vitamin D are the supplements that I recommend. Right. That, that was it. Um, our list is, is, is the complete. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Boy, that was so good. And, you know, before you go, doctor, if you don't mind, uh, I think we had a few other people that had written to me that they have questions. I'd like to just, um, not have you be late for your daughter, but uh -huh. maybe use the last few minutes for extra questions. Yeah, sure. Work too yeah. hard. Um, and thank you so much. Um, let me see. I'm going to just go in, um, in order here. Um, why don't I start with um, Lisa? Could you ask your question first? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, you touched on this point just now when uh, Rika asked about bone turnover markers and um, you said sometimes insurance doesn't cover them. Um, are there any constraints on you um, from mentioning to a patient if you think a test or a particular medication not yet part of the standard of care for one reason or another, maybe because insurance doesn't cover it and it would cause problems if the patient called the insurance company and complained. Or maybe, and this happened to somebody in the group because something hasn't yet made it into the standard of care or actually her insurance wasn't covering vanity. Um, and she'd already started on prolia and then she found out. So the point is, if you are aware that something might benefit a patient, let's say a patient is willing to pay for a test yeah. that is not covered by insurance, are there any constraints on you from mentioning that to the patient? No, I mean, generally I do my best to kind of ignore issues related to insurance coverage and kind of deal with them as they come up. And, and so, you know, frequently I'm kind of on the phone talking to appeals agents explaining why, you know, what, what I'm, I'm recommending what I think is the best thing for, for, for you, not what I think is the best thing for, you know, the insurance company. And, and, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think certainly we appeal insurance company decisions all the time and they make decisions for bad reasons sometimes. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, and this is not, not a specific issue to osteoporosis care. This is across the board for all medical problems. And, you know, many doctors like me are kind of running into these, these issues. And so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, what is best for the patient and what the insurance company wants to do aren't always completely aligned and I'm on my patient's side. So just to, to MGH or partners doesn't prevent you contractually or otherwise oh. from going beyond the standard of care, shall we say? No, I mean, I can, can't order experimental medications, but if a drug, you know, if a, a drug is FDA approved and I want to use it, you know, in, you know, in an order that the insurance company disagrees with, you know, the, the, my employer has nothing to do with that. That's kind of my, within the scope of my practice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I also want to call on uh, Amy. Amy mentioned, do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Dr. Oh, 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 okay. Which one? Uh, well, why don't we start with uh, you and then Amy Blywis after. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is, do you know of any um, approved products for premenopausal women? And if not, um, uh, studies or investigational candidates for premenopausal women? 
It's a great question. Um, so I, I should have said that more clearly. So I was talking about post, all the medications I'm talking about relate to postmenopausal osteoporosis, uh, which is a common disease and there are many FDA approved options. You know, premenopausal osteoporosis is actually an orphan disease according to the FDA, meaning there are, you know, very few, um, uh, uh, you know, the incidence is relatively low and there are no approved medications for premenopausal osteoporosis. Um, I see women uh, who are, you know, premenopausal quite a bit who have broken bones and have low bone density. And, you know, they're challenging discussions because all these medications that I mentioned have been studied in women who are mainly 60 and over, not even 50 and over. Um, and, and so, uh, just be, and so, you know, we don't totally know that medications are safe and effective. Um, uh, for, uh, for premenopausal women. Um, you know, I, I think it, kind of knowing where, exactly how old you are is important because, you know, the bisphosphonate medications stick around in your bones for a long time and can cross the placenta and cause growth defects. And so, you know, we're not, so for somebody who's young and still considering additional childbearing, you know, that's uh, a bit of a more complicated issue. And, you know, we do try to avoid bisphosphonates. You know, I, I would say that, you know, if treatment of premenopausal osteoporosis is kind of of concern, you know, there's a wonderful woman, um, Addie Cohen, who works in Columbia, who's kind of in New York City, who's kind of the best in the world for premenopausal osteoporosis. Um, I certainly oh, really? okay. I, I, I see patients as well, but often I end up calling her anyway. And so you know, if you have the resources to get to, or if you can get to New York City uh, to see Addie, Addie Cohen, that would be my recommendation. Oh, Addie, thank you. Yeah, she's running studies um, as well, looking at Forteo, oh, really? mainly looking at Forteo and Timlos for premenopausal osteoporosis. Oh wow. I know yeah. the product really well. Um, I know Tim Lowe's well, more because I'm a, I'm a lawyer in pharma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and I used to do work for them. But uh, yeah, oh, cool. I'll, I'll look her up. Hey, Amy, you're on. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm going to be really quick because you have just a very short time before you have to go. Um, I have a few questions, but the, I guess the most important question I have for you would be, about bone quality versus bone density or bone integrity. Um, you were saying, you were mentioning that there isn't really very, there aren't, there isn't much known because I mean, you can meet people that have very bad osteoporosis and they never break a bone. And it's sort of like, you wonder why that is. And I'm just wondering if there's more information about that that's out. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, you know, there are tons of research going on. So what I can tell you is that, um, you know, look at looking at the genes, because I think that gives us some clues. So if you look at the genes that are associated with bone density, many of the, the most of the genes that are associated with bone density are also associated with fractures. Um, and so that means that there's kind of a causal link for many patients with those gene variants between bone density and fractures. But there are genes that are associated with bone density that aren't linked with fractures. And there are genes that are associated with fractures that aren't linked to bone density, indicating that there's kind of more to it. So, you know, a fracture, you know, is uh, something that happens to you. Bone density is what we see when we take an x-ray. So, you know, there are certainly people who break bones because they fall a lot. Um, there are people with, you know, muscle problems um, and, you know, or neurologic problems that cause, that cause them to fall and, you know, sustain fractures, even though their bone density is okay. Um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of research going on looking at bone quality rather than bone quantity, really, is, which is what we measure with bone density. You know, um, bone quality is determined by, you know, how the collagens in the bone are aligned mm -hmm. and how those, you know, collagen fibers are kind of cross-linked to each other. And so the kind of, there are a lot of advanced imaging methods that are currently under investigation that try to get at the, you know, bone quality rather than bone quantity. Um, if you're interested, I'm happy to kind of connect you with some investigators. You can get my email from, from Shelly. Okay. So what, the, so just to clarify what you're saying is, so they're also looking at people who have osteoporosis and don't fracture. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's hard because we, uh, we, the other way to put this is you have osteoporosis and haven't fractured yet, but you're right. I mean, there are lots and lots of people who live with osteoporosis and never sustain a fracture. And, you know, um, uh, so those people are important people to study as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much, actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I see that, um, that Steffi has her hand raised. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to... Um, if you have one second. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. So I, 
I came on a little late. I was on a board meeting for something else. But um, as I came on, you said something about Prolia and Forteo together being um, strengthening agents. And I want to know, um, does that mean, I just had my first Prolia shot a few months ago. Does that mean I should be calling and asking about a combination? Or so the combination of Prolia, it's a great question. The combination of Prolia, first of all, Prolia is a wonder, a fantastic medication and on its own, it's very effective. So, you know, I'm glad that, that you're on that and it's a great choice for osteoporosis therapy. You know, generally we reserve that combination of Prolia and Forteo for people who have you know, quite severe osteoporosis meaning, okay. you know, T-scores below minus 3.5, multiple fractures already. So where we want to be kind of as aggressive as possible, um, you know, so yeah, you might want to bring it up with your pre prescribing provider to, you know, make sure that you don't fit into that category. But in the, in the case that you don't, you know, prolia monotherapy is also a great, um, a great choice. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Wonderful. One more quick one. Uh, well, sure. Yeah. Okay, um, but, but this has to be the, the last one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, theoretically, like I've just started because my score went down, I started more rigorous exercising. I've been jogging and stuff like that. Theoretically, shouldn't increased exercise and even, you know, tough exercise gonna lead to increased bone density? It, you know, it, it does. Uh, weight bearing exercise does increase bone mass. The question is how much. And, um, you know, I, I think we you can see increases in bone density in kind of the 0.5 to 1% range over the course of a couple of years with weight bearing exercise, whereas the medications are triple, quadruple, five times that. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I wish we that exercise was good enough. And what's really interesting, what I'll end, end on, is that in younger people, you know, people in their teens and 20s, exercise, you know, repeated weight bearing exercise can increase bone density like three to 5% per year. So if something happens to how our bones respond to exercise with aging that, you know, there's a defective exercise, skeletal exercise response with aging. And, you know, I've already crossed the threshold as well, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, so we're trying to study that and understand kind of why young people show this beautiful, you know, ad adaptive response to exercise, but old, older individuals don't. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, exercise alone probably isn't enough to kind of get you across that threshold to, you know, lower your fracture risk is the short answer to my question. And, and it isn't, to, um, I, I just a couple of people have texted me. It isn't to say that it isn't important. And that we oh, without a doubt. I mean, uh, we owe, I mean, absolutely. Exercise is always part of it, part of the kind of what we're doing, treating actively. And, you know, I, I think exercise is not just for your bones as well, you know, for your muscles, for your heart, for your lungs, for everything, for your, your brain. Uh, you know, there are so many good things about exercise. So I'm not saying not to exercise. I'm saying exercise in addition to these other things that we're talking about. Wow. This has been so helpful. Um, you, I, I don't know if you've been reading the chat, but everybody's oh, thank so you. thrilled with uh, your uh, answers. And thank you for doing it so quick. Every yeah. single thing that, you know, just you were okay. a speed speaker. <laughs> Lots to come. I'm excited about the topic. Well, I mean, thank you so much for the invitation. And hopefully you have my contact information um, from, the, from the slides. And if I guess, Shelly, if you could share my email with people who have additional questions, sure. I'm happy to, happy to talk offline. <laughs> thank you so right. much. I have thank to run to bedtime now. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Oh, that was excellent. Yeah.